All right. Am I on? I'm not on yet. Okay, there. Are we there yet? Yeah, I've, I've got the, the, the light, the green light is on. The green light is on. The green light is still on. You want me to change to a different color? There we go. We're getting there, aren't we? We're not getting there? Are we there yet? No, that was me. <laughs> Didn't want Thomas freaking out back there. Okay, here we go. Anytime now. If everyone would gather right in here, we wouldn't need the mic. Well, well they have to have it for online stuff for recording. Let me change mics. Want me to change mics? You guess. Well, your guess is as good as mine right now. Okay, here we go. Changing mics. Are we there yet? Red? Red. Nope. <clears throat> so far, this is quite a challenge. Yeah, that's the issue. Okay. Oh, I know. I'm online. I'm trying to get the mic to where it's working. We're not getting anything here. Thomas, is there anything up here that's on that shouldn't be? Okay. 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 Here we are with pulpit mic. Holding. <laughs> How y'all doing tonight? Good. See, I told you we weren't going to bother us. We can't even get the microphones going. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there we go. 
All right, so does that mean these others are going to work now? Yeah. All right, we're going to the red. Is the red working? The red is working. Okay, great job, Thomas. Way to go. Give Thomas a hand. There we go. Yes. Lovely. There will be some lovely party gifts for you later, Thomas. Now, I've told our, our men at work here, just keep working, okay? If we can't focus on God's Word in this world, then we have issues. So we want this work to be accomplished. They're doing everything they can to get things cleaned up and finished. I just said, go for it. We'll be all right, okay? All right. And, and basically, the way I look at it is this. <clears throat> If it doesn't bother God, it shouldn't bother us. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna let them do their work, and we're gonna go ahead. Um, well, obviously, I'm not Jim, and if if I would have been, the microphones would have worked right away, I'm sure. But uh, Jim and Lori took off for Texas. They've got a funeral that they are attending uh, tomorrow, and so they needed to get on down there for that. So I'm always honored and delighted to be able to fill in uh, any time to to teach for him. And uh, even with the group that we have here on Wednesday night, <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm still glad to be here, okay? Uh, I told him this afternoon, we were in here talking and watching him work, and I shared with him that, um, uh, you know, I had my teaching ready, and he said, well, Laurie and I, we're going to be listening to you on the way down to Texas. I said, oh, well, I better change my teaching. Uh, he looked at me, I said, yeah, I was going to teach on how to know when you've got the wrong pastor. So he decided maybe I should change that one. But no, seriously, I, I already had this one in place that God led me to. Something that's, that's probably a little bit different. I asked Jim, I said, have you, teached on the, on the, uh, have you taught on the burnt offering lately? He goes, no. <laughs> I said, well, good. We won't be covering each other up in this one. So we'll go with that. Um, let's start with a, uh, a prayer uh, as God leads us in our study tonight, all right? Father, I thank you so much for this time together. Um, that we can be in your house, Father, and always in your house. Not only we share the fellowship of Jesus Christ with one another, but we also uh, open up the word and break that together and partake of it. So let your spirit freely talk to us. And let's just don't teach the, uh, uh, treat this as just another teaching. But Father, what do you want us to learn from this? and help us in our daily walk. And so, Father, let me be your vessel. Speak through me without reservation, and let me honor you in doing so. And I pray all of this for your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, the burnt offering, as you can see, on the, I, I wanted to use the new screens, so that's why I did a little PowerPoint tonight. But uh, uh, the burnt offering, you can see, it's going to be out of Leviticus uh, chapter 1. I did this teaching of all the offerings several years ago when I was pastoring at Delaware Baptist, and I had one of my really good church members come to me about three or four Sundays after I'd started the series, and she admitted to me, she says, Gary, when you started this, I thought this is going to be the most boringest thing I've ever heard to go through the book of Leviticus and look at some of these things. And I said, well, normally I would have agreed with you. But when we understand the purpose of all the offerings that are mentioned in Leviticus, just like all the feasts that are mentioned, everything is pointing to Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that borne out here in, in just a few moments. But um, before our teaching, I, I want us to first consider the tabernacle and how it was used uh, before the temple was built. Uh, John 1.14 tells us, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen the glory, His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And the word dwelt there actually uh, means tabernacled. We have seen Jesus Christ, the Word of God, become flesh, and He dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us is what it's saying. And so just as Jesus did that in the flesh, so God's Spirit was in the tabernacle as, as God had Moses set this up uh, in, in the early days of Israel. And uh, the Holy Spirit dwelt in the tabernacle. And then later on in the temple, of course, we saw the Ark of the Covenant and, and the, the Spirit of God residing on that, the very presence of God's Shekinah glory that rested on top of the mercy seat. Um, the specific layout of the tabernacle and its courtyard is always significant for us 
as we look at it because it illustrates God's prescribed way of how man is to come to him. All right? There's always a purpose in what God lays out. Don't just treat it like, oh, well, okay, this is here, this is here, this is here. No, there's a reason that each one of these things are in place as they do. I'm not going to go very far into that because it would take up uh, all of our time tonight. But God is using the Old Testament tabernacle to tell us that we must come to him through the only way he's provided for us, and that's Jesus Christ. You'll see on the screens, you can see that on the far right-hand side, that is the gate. That's the only opening for the tabernacle. Everything else was, was sealed up around it with the uh, curtain-like fence that you can see, the skins that hung from that. But uh, the, the gate, the, the one opening in the tent uh, was it, uh, only one entrance. Uh, so therefore, a person could not just simply come from any direction into the tabernacle as desired, as he pleased. He had to enter through the one gate, uh, which was always located to the east. And that way, when people came into the tabernacle area, they would face west. And the reason for that is because the pagans of that day, when they did their worship, they faced to the east. And so God had them set up in perfect you know, opposition, uh, contrast to what the pagans did so there wouldn't be any conflict about what, what are we doing here and who are we worshiping and things like that. Um, now, I, I think that's you know, incredible, significant, and God always plays that out. Here in another couple of weeks, some of us are going to be in Israel uh, again for some of us, and, and we're going to, you know, at some point we're going to see where the temple was from the Mount of Olives, but of course it's the same thing. You know, we'll be facing west as we look at it, and that's where the entrance was to the temple. And when you went through the Golden Gate, the Eastern Gate, the Beautiful Gate, as it's called, uh, when you went through there, that was on the east side of the old city. And so therefore, when you first saw the temple, you would be facing the west to do it, just like the tabernacle was set up. Um, the one and only gate in Scripture is a full representation of Jesus Christ because he said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I'm the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So it's a very distinct why God set this up for the Israelites. Remember, everything in the Old Testament is there pointing to Christ. It's a sign. Now, be very careful in your study of the Old Testament. It's easy to look at some of these things, whether they're the, the offerings or the feast, especially for some people, or some of the other signs that are given. Some people get so excited about that, and they, they get wrapped up in it, and they want to, oh, yeah, we want to celebrate this feast, and we want to do that. I said, no, no, we, we don't do that. We, it's Christ has already fulfilled those things. It's like if we, uh, we travel from, from here to Jay and we're going along and we see a sign that says Jay 8 miles. Well, we don't stop and hang on to the sign and say, oh, well, I've arrived. No, no. The sign is simply pointing the way to the destination of where we're going. We're not to stop at any of these signs and say, oh, this is it. No, the signs are directing us where to go, and that is to Jesus Christ, and that is whom we embrace. Well, as you go through that, that opening gate, the, the, the one entrance that you have, you can see the very first thing that, that you encounter, and that is the bronze altar. Um, before approaching God, something has to be done with our sin because you can't just go into God's presence with sin. And so you encounter, after going through the, the, the gate of the court of the tabernacle, the bronze altar. It was also called the slaughter place in Hebrew. And the fire was constantly kept burning on that. And that was, uh, that was a sign of, jo of God's continual judgment upon sin. So in other words, the people, the Israelites, as they, as they came to the tabernacle area, they would always be aware of who they're encountering, but also what is going on, that they've got to do something with this sin because God's continually judging that. Well, so it is for the believer. You know, we don't have the bronze altar in that sense, but we certainly have the Holy Spirit within us, you know, the fire from heaven that convicts us, and doesn't let us get away with anything as his children. When you get convicted of the Holy Spirit, um, first of all, the bad news is that you've done something wrong. The good news is that you're still a child of God because he's convicting you. And he always will as a child of God. That's never going to change that. 
but the fact is that he's still working in your life, and, and that's, that is the good sign of that, and that he's a merciful God, and he's going to allow us to come back to him when we truly repent. Now, each time we approach God for worship, um, we should be reminded really how vile our sin is. Anybody like me, do you ever fall into a trap of looking at some other people and thinking, boy, their sin is so terrible? <laughs> and, and then realizing, oh my, I'm looking at myself on how I was before I was saved. And, and you realize that my sin is just as vile as any person's. Sunday morning, I got called out to deal with a very difficult situation at the hospital. And it was one of those situations where I could have looked at a lot of people and I thought, oh my, oh my, how did they get in this spot? But really, God was telling me, no, you were in that spot. And without my grace, you would still be in that spot. And, and um, I think that's why God has me in ministry at the hospital. It's just to remind me of, with all the things that I see of how bad I really am as well. But when we, when we approach God and we realize that our sin is real, I, I think it does several things for us. It helps us in, in our worship because the first thing, when we realize that we're sinful, it, it makes us eager to be cleansed. You know, when I go out and oh, I've been working on my bicycle for the last week, every, you know, every time I change the tire on it, the, you know, to get a new inner tube, and then I'll ride it, and then I'll get another flat and whatever. And so I become an expert on changing the bike, especially the rear wheel on this electric bicycle. Getting pretty good at it now. But I get through with that, and I'm dirty. My, look, you know, even if I got gloves on, I've got tire all over me or something. Uh, and I want to go inside and get a shower. I want to get cleansed. And people spiritually, we should always be that way when our sin. We should always desire to have a cleansing from God. Secondly, uh, when we really know that our sin is that bad, it should make us more apt and, and to avoid sin. I mean, when, you, when you're convicted and you repent and God has refreshed you and restored you, doesn't that make you want to say, boy, I am not going to do that anymore. And of course, that's when we really need to depend on his power because that's the only way we're going to avoid it. We can't do it in our own strength. But it should make us want to avoid sin. It should make us more thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You know, just to know when we, you know, we sing some of these wonderful praise songs on, on Sunday mornings and, and we sing some of these and it talks about Christ's sacrifice and, and, and on the cross and, and you realize, I put him there. I did that. And, and, and so it, it should make us so much more thankful to his sacrifice. And finally, it, it should, it should uh, make our worship more genuine. You know, sometimes we can, it's so easy. You know, we're, maybe we're tired. We didn't sleep well Saturday night or, or whatever the reason is. We've got something else on our mind. And, and we come in and we can treat worship with God casual. I've done this before. <laughs> I'm here every Sunday. Sure, I can do this, but every, every day is unique. And every time we come in to worship God, whether it's in our prayer closet or whether it's collectively here, it, it needs to be a refreshing time where we realize I've not been here at this moment before. And God has something else for me today. And my worship needs to be pure before him. Thomas, if you would, advance the slide. The Levitical offerings involve a threefold approach for us as we look at this. So Thomas is going to make that happen. Oh, good job. And it'll come up on the screen. The threefold approach that we look at is, first of all, in the beginning, it was a way for the Old Testament saints to properly relate to God. They had to do it through the, through the offering. Secondly, all of these, as I mentioned a while ago, is a typology of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. And the last thing we look at that we should be able to gain from tonight, even from the burnt offering especially, I think, is the fact that um, we have the application as far as how our approach to God should be. And so I, that's what I want us to look at tonight as, as, as I go through this teaching. Um, a burnt offering is first mentioned, uh, it's the very first offering specified by name in, Bible for, in the Bible. For one thing, Noah offered a burnt offering uh, when he left the ark. 
Um, Abel's offering was certainly a burnt offering as well, even though it wasn't called such. But the burnt offering is the most um, common of the offerings mentioned in Scripture. Uh, when you go through and look at it, it's mentioned 197 times. That's a lot of times. You know, God only has to say something once for it to be significant. But here he's put this in 197 times. And so that should really get our attention and let us know that there's, there's some real purpose behind it. Now, within this um, burnt offering, we really have the highest aspect of the work of Christ where he is seen offering himself up entirely to his Father's will, even unto death. Go ahead, Thomas, with the next one. Only got four slides, so we're already halfway through. How's that? The, the, the rest may go a little slower. I don't know. Jesus Christ is certainly fulfilling of all the offerings, but the burnt offering pictures Christ who gave himself for us. As you can see, Ephesians 5, 2, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Um, Christ, now here's the difference. Here's the significance. Yes, you have to have your sins taken care of before you come to God, but that sin offering is not the first one mentioned in Leviticus. The burnt offering is, and here's the reason why. Here's a spoiler alert. Christ here is not seen as bearing our sins, but he is seen as accomplishing the Father's will which will ultimately be taking care of our sins. But it'll be accomplishing the Father's will, glorifying him and vindicating the holiness and the majesty of his throne. And here's the key. Go ahead, Thomas, and hit that next button. It'll advance something on this screen for us. Here's, if you, if you get nothing else from tonight, you know, get this. Surrender comes before sacrifice. The burnt offering was this. Jesus Christ surrendered himself completely to the Father's will. That's the burnt offering. That is what is applicable for us as well. Unless we surrender ourselves completely to God, every aspect of us, as you're going to see here in a moment from the teaching, every aspect, we're, if we're withholding anything, then we're not completely surrendered. Jesus completely surrendered everything. It says he laid his glory aside so that he could do what the Father sent him to do. He totally glorified the Father. So the very first offering, see, God looks at these things from his perspective, not ours. If ours, we would have said, yeah, the sin offering has to be first so we can get to God. God says, before the sin offering happens, I want to, I want to know that I've got all of you. I want to make sure I've got all of you. And that's what the Son did. So let's get right into the, um, the actual scripture as I'll be reading it for us. So um, go ahead and go to the last slide, Thomas, uh, and then you'll have to stay over there close to it to advance these as, as I need them advanced, okay? So uh, let's see, the first one come up, or you may have to hit it. There we go. The very first thing, the offering was brought, verses 1 through 3. Let me read this for you. This is out of the uh, English Standard Version. The, the Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting, that he may be accepted before the Lord." Notice the phrase here when it says, When anyone among you brings an offering, it indicates that it was offered by the presenter's own voluntary will. God did not say here, you have to do that. No, he says when this happens, when it is brought, you've brought an offering. It is something you've chosen to do. Jesus in John six thirty eight said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. It was, a, it was totally on Jesus' free will part that he chose to come and do this for us. The father didn't say, son, you've got to do this or it's all over between us. <laughs> no, that, that, that's absurd. No, Jesus willingly did this. And 
And it says from the herd or from the flock, that means that there's going to be shedding of blood that's going to happen. And we know that there is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. It says a male without blemish. Obviously, that points to Christ and the fact that we are not without blemish. And finally, it says by way of the entrance. It means we need to follow God's pattern for worship. Again, Jesus is the gate and the only way. So he's already laid out from the very first few verses here how someone comes to him. They come willingly. They come through the place where he says they are to come. They are told, here's what you bring and that there will be shedding of blood. So already, even though it's the burnt offering, already in their minds, they, are, they already know with the shedding of blood, it's going to be taking care of sins in their sacrifice as they give it as a sin offering as well. Let's go on to verse 4. Thomas, go ahead and hit it. The offering... After it was brought, the offering was accepted by God. And it says in verse 4, He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. All right, here we are. Somebody willingly bringing it. Here's, I am willingly coming before you with this burnt offering. I am giving myself, if you would. But I'm going to demonstrate it by laying my hand upon the sacrifice. And the laying on of hands in the Bible usually meant the bestowing of something to another, whether it was honor or blessing, or in this case, sin. And the putting of the hand on the head of the offering uh, was really bestowing uh, the responsibility or the guilt. And it indicated a desire on the presenter's part that the offering um, take the place of the presenter. In Scripture, we call it substitution or uh, uh, imputation, the doctrine of imputation. It's substitution. Christ was our substitute. All of our sin was what? Laid upon him. That is the picture that we have from God. It's just like the hand that was laid upon this sacrifice. All that sin was laid upon Jesus Christ when he died for us. So even though the burnt offering was not dealing with specific sins that had been committed, but it was that the presenter wanted to give himself to God and be acceptable to him. Here he is laying his life on the, on the offering, on the sacrifice. He's not transferring sin at this point, but he is transferring himself. This is me, God. This is me. And God is what? Accepting it as such. So the offering is accepted in that way. Let's go to the next one, Thomas. After the offering was brought, the offering was accepted, and then the offering was killed. Verse 5, Then he shall kill the bull before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priest, shall bring the blood and throw the blood against the sides of the altar that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. It was killed before the Lord. This meant that it was killed in front of the tabernacle at this bronze altar, a, a place which represented the presence of the Lord, the, the tabernacle area itself. And so it's done before him. You know, any sacrifices that we make in life, and that, that's probably pretty guarded. I mean, sometimes we interpret something as a sacrifice, and it's really not. It's, it's something that's convenient for us. But if it's truly a sacrifice, it should be done from the heart, and therefore it's before the Lord because he knows our hearts. He, he sees our hearts. He lives within us. And so it's always done before the Lord in that way. And, and uh, it was killed by the one that was making the offering. That means, guess what? It's a voluntary act. Not only did, in his own will, did the presenter bring the sacrifice, but now, and he, and he lays himself, he makes that substitution, this is my life, putting on the sacrifice, in the sacrifice in that way, in the presence of God. But now as he kills it, he voluntarily kills it. Jesus, the fulfillment of all says in John 10, 17, the reason my father loves me or accepts me is that I lay down my life. Jesus willingly not only gave himself fully to them, and then once he gave himself fully, guess what? Whatever the father wants is the way it's going to be. And in this situation, Jesus Christ was going to be the atonement for the world. 
the atonement for all that would come to him, to pay for all sins. There are times in my life I wonder, <clears throat> and I have to think, if I have totally surrendered myself to God, why is it that sometimes I have to think twice about something when God tells me? That's not right. It, it, it hardly conveys how the real relationship between a master and a slave is, and we are slaves for Christ. But when the master says something, the slave just says, well, no, wait a minute. <laughs> no, the slave simply does it. But here we are, <clears throat> we're slaves, but we are his children as well. And we love him because he first loved us. So shouldn't our immediate response every time, if we've fully given ourselves to him, then it's never a debate, it's never a question, it's never room for second thought. It's simply, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Now, we may have to ask him exactly, now, how do you want me to do this? That's, that's fine, but it's, you're still saying you're going to do it. And God will lay it out for you if he's called you to do it. And also in this verse that I read, in verse 5, talks about how the, how the sons of Aaron, the priests, they would, they would take the blood and they would throw it against the side of the, of the brazen altar. The blood was sprinkled, and this was a common practice under the law. It meant to sanctify something, to cleanse the impure. And, and it was sprinkled by the priest as, as mediators for the presenter. Um, the presenter could do so much in the presence of God in the Old Testament system but the priest still had to be there to be the mediators. And they took the blood, even after he killed the sacrifice, the presenter, they would take the blood and they would sprinkle it against the brazen altar uh, to make the offering acceptable to the Lord because the blood covers completely. And that's what God was getting across to them. The blood has to cover it all. And so that's why they would take it and they would sprinkle it in that way. You remember when Moses talked to the people on one occasion, and he's trying to get God's word across to him. He says, he says, now the Lord has spoken to you. Will you do this? And they all said, yes, we'll do everything that God says. <laughs> and, what God, and what did Moses do to seal it? He took the hyssop branch, put it in the sacrifice, the blood of the sacrifice, and sprinkled it on the people. He was sealing them with the blood. It was a picture of what was going to happen to us as we are sealed in the blood of Jesus Christ. But, but that's what Moses did. It, it was to cover completely. People, we're covered completely by the blood of Christ. Amen. Boy, I tell you what, that is needful more and more every day we see it. But it's always been true once we come to Christ. So it's a type, once again, that with a typology that was fulfilled by Jesus Christ as our great high priest. Because he is our mediator. In fact, in, in Hebrews 12, 24... It says, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Remember the old covenant was what? The old system, under the law. He brings what? The new covenant, his blood, the covenant of grace. It says, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, some people look and they say, well, what does that mean? Better word than the blood of Abel. Well, Abel was murdered. Abel did not give his life willingly. He was murdered. Jesus Christ was not murdered. Oh, he's on the cross, Gary. The Romans put him on the cross and they killed him. He was murdered. No, he told everyone, I willingly lay my life down and I pick it up again. He, he had the will to do that as well as the power. And so uh, he was not murdered. He gave himself for us, far, far different. And that's why his sprinkled blood is far different than any other blood that's been shed. Well, let's move to the next one here. Verse 6, the uh, offering was prepared. I think it's next on the screen. Yes, it certainly is. Thomas, you're doing great work. I appreciate it. It says, then he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. You're saying, okay, Gary, big deal. We've... We've all done barbecue before. We know how to put out pieces and things like that. And, and by the way, by the way, nobody used this teaching as an excuse. If you burn dinner and you try to explain to the family, I gave it my all. It Just don't do that, okay? Some of you caught that. Very good. Y'all get bonus points up front. Okay. Yeah, it, 
Yeah, we don't get bonus points for burning dinner, all right? I gave it my all. It was a burnt offering. Yeah, I know. All right, what's the purpose of this verse? What is God saying in this? Well, he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into the piece. The, the skin being considered unclean, that was not part of the burnt offering. That was, that was disposed of. And the reason is, is that God is not concerned with our outward appearance, but our heart. And the offering was cut into pieces because each part had to be separate from the others so that each part was sacrificed, but each part is sanctified as well. And as each part was put out there, it tells us that nothing is withheld in our surrender to God. You know, growing up as a teenager, I, I was very faithful in church. My wife can attest to that since we grew up in the same church. You know, but there, there was still something in, 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 uh, that I didn't quite get as a teenager because I always thought, okay, I'm going to have God first in my life. That's always a good start. And then for, after that, it was, uh, you know, my, my family life and going to church and, and for me, football uh, and then uh, dating. Uh, now, when I dated Christy in high school, it went way up on the list, but other times it was low. Now, I thought all of that sounded so good, doesn't it? But the problem with that is I had Christ separated from all these other th areas. And what I needed to look at was, okay, here's my social life. Christ has to be preeminent in my social life. And here in my, in my hobby time, my football, playing high school football, Christ had to be preeminent in that. And in my family life, or going to church, or anything like that, Christ has to be preeminent. Because every part of me has been sacrificed. It's all been spread apart so that God takes all of it, each individual piece, everything that belongs to you. Um, you know, it sounds so good when we, when we say, well, I give, I give Christ everything first and then these other things. Well, even if it's 99%, that other 1% is bad <laughs> if you're not honoring God within those things, within those areas. Let's go to the next one. The fire was prepared and the offering arranged, verses 7 and 8. It says, And the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. And Aaron's sons the priest shall arrange the pieces, the head and the fat, on the wood that is on the fire on the altar. This is a little bit more uh, specific of what verse 6 said. Now, um, if you catch it earlier, I did say that there was a continual fire that burned on the altar. So why are these guys having to put more wood and fire on it this way? Well, the fire was built up for particular offerings is why. They always kept the fire going, as I said, as a symbol of God's judgment. But there were particular offerings that came into place, and what they would do was build up the fire more uh, to, to consume these particular offerings. And why all the parts as they're mentioned this way? Well, they are, once again, as I was talking about the various areas of a person's life. The, the head could be the mind and the soul of a man. The fat may be our pleasures and our joys. But take note because God, this is the, the commandment of God, the instruction of God. So it's telling me that God is totally interested in every aspect of our lives. All of our thoughts, all of our motives, ooh, that's conviction. Everything we do, everything we say, everything we hope for, God is con he's concerned with all of those things. And all of those things, er different areas need to be dedicated to him. And finally, we come to verse 9. And in verse 9 we read, oh, it's coming up on the screen, there we go. The entire offering was consumed. It says, but its entrails and its legs he shall wash with water, that's for the cleansing, and the priest shall burn all of it on the altar as a burnt offering, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. When we look at Leviticus and we start studying all of the offerings together, we see that the very first three offerings, the burnt offering, the meat offering, and the peace offering, they're all voluntary offerings and they all, because they're voluntary, they have a sweet savor 
to the Lord. Remember that verse we shared earlier from Ephesians of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice? What did it say that he was? He was a sweet savor to the Lord. Because why? It was voluntary. It was voluntary. The last two offerings that we look at in the Leviticus, the sin and the trespass offering, those are required, and therefore they're not called sweet savers to the Lord. If we do something for God, and it's something he requires us to do, why do we put ourselves out there like, look what I've done for God? He's required us to do that. Now, when we willingly do something for him, we're not going to even make a spectacle out of it because we know it's for his glory or he wasn't willing. That is a sweet savor to the Lord. When we just willingly do something and it's evident, uh, it's evidently sweet to the Lord because we serve him out of love because he first loved us. The burnt offering was totally consumed on the altar as a gift to God. Our sacrifice to God must be in the same way. We need, when we say we're giving ourselves to him, and we're, and we're totally earnest in our hearts, and, and this is not just a one-time thing. This is an everyday thing. You know, when we get up each day, I thank God for the breath that I've received when I get up, and then the, the sleep that I've had. If it wasn't perfect, he'll still rest and sleep. And then I said, God, how do you want to use me today? I said, I know I'm going to come into some circumstances, some that are going to be very enjoyable and some that I just totally detest. Today I, I, I was making a patient uh, visit to one of the patient rooms and, and um uh, patient and her husband, uh, uh, very, very uh, godly people. And you could tell, I mean, you could tell they've got the word, okay? And we were talking about prophecy and, and things like that. And just, I could have, we could have sat and talked for hours and hours and hours. You know, I, I was talking to the husband for about 15 minutes. And finally, I looked at her, the patient in the bed. I said, oh, by the way, we're going to get to you in a moment. <laughs> I did come in to see you, by the way. But we, we just shared, and it was so wonderful to share those things uh, with each other and I could tell that they they were totally consumed of God and I want to put myself in a position every day every moment where I'm just totally consumed by him you know so there's nothing left of Gary uh, you know people tell me things to the hospital oh Gary you're so nice I said I'm the chaplain <laughs> what do you expect and I'm on the clock now, catch me when I'm not off the clock. I may not be as nice, you know. So y'all catch me like that, okay? We need to be totally consumed all the time as we give ourselves entirely to God. Because after all, this is our reasonable service. Paul reiterates that in Romans 12, 1, as I close. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, and that means ancestors in the Greek, by the mercies of God. To present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. How are we really to worship God? We come in here every Sunday morning and we think singing the songs is worship. Well, in part it is. And praying is worship. In part it is. And giving of the offerings that, that are taken up, tithes and offerings, that's, that's also part of worship. But the main, the most important part of worship is knowing that we are a living sacrifice. And we are going to be holy as God sanctifies us, being separate from this world. And therefore, we're going to be acceptable to, be him, uh, to him and be used by him. And that, my friends, is spiritual worship. And that's where we need to be. So, thank you for being attentive tonight and, and listening to that teaching. Um, you see, the burnt offering is more than just taking a sacrifice and slapping it on the grill and burning it up. There's so much more to it than that. And that's why God details each bit of that for us. Well, if you have your prayer sheets, let's look at this together for a few moments here before we dismiss. Um, 
glad that um, uh, uh, Beverly Double D is, is home. She was, uh, had to come into the ER yesterday. And um, I'll tell you what, you know, here I am. I, 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 make, I saw her name, and so I went and made that visit in the ER. And um, Michael was there, her husband, and said, uh, Gary, I forgot my phone. Could you call, can you call Pastor Jim? I said, absolutely. I call Jim, and within a few minutes, he's up there to make that visit and then see somebody else in the hospital as well. That's what kind of pastor we have, okay? I want you to know that. Uh, he's, he's fantastic. Because I can tell you what, as chaplain up there, there are a lot of pastors in the area I never see. I never see. I see Jim all the time when he's needed. Um, uh, Virginia Grounds and, and, and family at the death of Jean is listed. Mary Hamilton was also in the hospital, and today, as it, as it shares, updated on your list, she was, she was moved to Grandwood uh, on hospice, um, not, not expected um, to, to live much longer, only, only God knows, but, uh, but, but she was moved back over to Grandwood where she had been staying, and uh, lovely family, incredible family, big family, but they're all just wonderful people. Um, uh, Tom Huffman is having an angiogram this next week. Uh, Dee Humphrey will be seeing a surgeon for her back pain. Um, <clears throat> Larry and Joan Rives uh, with COVID, and she is at Mercy and Joplin, I see. Uh, John Sacrist with cancer. He's Martin, Marvin Smith's cousin. And then also uh, the under new additions, <coughs> Excuse me, Michael Sharp uh, had another stroke and um, is in Freeman family of Olin Hartman. Um, I'll tell you what, before just going through all of the list tonight, do any of you have any updates or others that you want us to be praying for uh, that you would like to share tonight with us? Okay. Well, please look over the list. And um, I challenge you, take the list. And, and I know sometimes we just, we fly through lists. So we pick, pick two or three of these and focus on them. Pray for them. And um, you, you won't go wrong in praying for them in this way, I know. Pray for them to realize the fullness of God's presence in their lives. Can't go wrong there, okay? And, and, and that way, whatever their need is, whether it's mental or emotional or, or spiritual or physical, it doesn't matter. If, if, if they realize God's presence is with them, they'll know that he's given his strength for them. He is the God of all comfort, and comfort in the Greek means strength. It's more than feeling sorry for somebody and being compassionate. Those are great, but no, he's the God of all comfort, the God of all strength. He's the one that gives us the ability to take another step, even though we don't think we can when we're in difficult situations. Also, with God's presence, that means his all-sufficient grace is available. And, and, and we are participating in his grace for sure in life. And maybe it's encouragement they need or, or, you know, just maybe a word from him, maybe instruction, maybe guidance, whatever it may be. If we pray for God's presence in people's lives, we see a difference being made. They, we see a connection. And so be praying for that uh, for all of our people here on our list. Um, for those that have asked about my brother, I'll, I'll just share that he's... Um, He's doing well uh, for the most part. His fourth treatment um, of, can of chemo wasn't the best as far as his response to it. Um, and at one point, he did have a, have a spell where he, he, uh, he passed out. His hemoglobin had really gotten low, so they got him some transfusions. But, uh, uh, but he's, he's doing all right, and he's, uh, he's got a great outlook on it. He's very strong in his faith and um, really kind of plays all this off as no big deal. Um, a little bit more than what the rest of the family wants him to play it off, but that's all right. That's, that's my brother. Uh, take note, there's upcoming events there. You can read that on the sheet. I won't go through those, but that's, that's pretty much it, okay? So, tell you what. See, didn't these guys do a great job? I mean, that wasn't bothering us at all. Thank you so much. We appreciate you working and doing all of that during our study. 
And uh, feel free to take pictures of the screen if you want, okay? That's free. Okay. All right, why don't we stand and have a closing uh, prayer tonight? And uh, Michael, my friend, you have such a wonderful way of sharing prayer to God. I'm going to ask you to dismiss us, if you would, please, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir, Gary. It's, it's an honor. Father, we appreciate Gary so very much for him filling in for pastor and he's such an exceptional exceptional christian to us he's been such a great addition to our our family our church family here and we thank you so much for him be with pastor jim and uh, laurie is there in texas pray that the, uh, the services there will do as well as possibly be expected under the circumstances. And uh, we praise you and we thank you and uh, for your son, Jesus Christ. And we give him all the praise and all the glory. And we just pray that uh, any person that may be here this evening who does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will be touched by these words from Leviticus and will come to know the true Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's his name we pray. Amen.